Well, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, we are very happy to have all the, today this meeting. As, as, as Dr. Rodriguez Javarini said, it's the second time we're having the ASEAN ambassadors in, in the CARI. Last year we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the organization. Now the, we decided to have a more informal grouping, a more informal setting. That's why we organize a kind of living room where we are all sitting here and where Ambassador Shu for myself will pose questions to the ambassadors in order and they will answer these questions regarding the future of ASEAN. I think ASEAN is a space of 10 very important nations in Southeast Asia. It's a grouping that is one of the most dynamic economic groupings in the world today. And it's a grouping with which Argentina has external relations. Not only economic, some of your countries are one of our main trading partners these days, but also we have very good political, we have very good cultural, and social relations. So what we expect with this meeting is to expand as much as we can from the, from the academic point of view these relations and to forge stronger links between Argentina and the 10 countries of the ASEAN, of which five have representation in Argentina. So starting with our, with our talk, I will ask the ambassador of Malaysia first place. Which were the causes that motivated the rapprochement between the countries of the region to establish ASEAN? Okay, for uh, the a very good uh, evening. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I'd like to uh, express my thanks and gratitude on behalf of my group, the ASEAN Committee in Buenos Aires, for this opportunity for all of us to be here and in a very informal setting and sharing with you what is ASEAN. Uh, before that, if uh, the chairman can allow me, if I just take one minute to express my gratitude and thanks, especially to Mr. President of CARI, uh, to, to this great gentleman, uh, Mr. Mario Shuf and also Mr. Eduardo Sados, because I remember it was two months ago when these two gentlemen visited me, because uh, I'm now the chairman of ASEAN Committee in Buenos Aires. We're very proud. This committee was just established on 19 July of this year. And Argentina uh, is among uh, the probably 50, 56 uh, ASEAN committee that we have in the world. So we are very proud of that. And it's a big achievement for ASEAN and also for Argentina. Uh, so these two gentlemen walk in my room and they told me, let's have this kind of uh, academia session. I said, yes, we will do it. And they were kind enough to come out with 18 questions. So all the questions are from them, not from us. So nothing, nothing is planted here. So I hope that. And, uh, and we have actually, I will say, done our homework. And we are actually given only three minutes per question. I cannot go more, two, more than three minutes. It will give me a red card. It's OK. I think as diplomat, we have a lot to see. OK, all right. So I also want to acknowledge the presence of my colleague, the ambassador of Pakistan here. We have our friends from the chamber. Yeah, we have friends from the academia, from the media, and certainly people of Buenos Aires. So we are very honored to be here, and uh, I think we will have a very fruitful session, and it is a win-win situation for all of us. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I will begin. So I've been given a question, what was the rapprochement that actually brought ASEAN in life? Why ASEAN was created? So as all of you are well aware, ASEAN was created in 1967. If I were to tell you 1967, probably all of you who are here will know what was the scenario then. But before ASEAN was created in 1967, they were already on three attempts, uh, members of the Southeast Asian country tried to create a loose regional kind of arrangement. What are the three? First was Seattle. SEOTO, Southeast Asia uh, 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 Treaty Organization, which was in 1954. Then come ASA, Association of Southeast Asia, which uh, came into life in 1961. And the last trial was Mark Lindo. 
It was an uh, arrangement between three countries, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Philippines, in 1964. So although this approach was done by our great leaders then, but it not really works. It did not work. Why? Because we were having our own problem. There were instability. There were confrontation between countries of civilization. I do not like to mention the names, but there were some problems that we could not move forward. But at the same time, please also consider three points that, that I will say will make which actually brought into ASEAN. One, ASEAN was also was the outcome of uh, the, uh, the, the issues that we had. We had the Vietnam War at the corner uh, during that time. Yeah, so these leaders, these five leaders was thinking that we need to have a loose organization where we can be together and speak in one voice. So five leaders, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, and the Philippines, they get together and they think that we must have a small, I will not say political organization, but organization where we can talk and speak in one voice. That is one. Because we were worried about the incidency. We were worried about the Vietnam, Vietnam War which was taking place, which can bring some implication to us. Second point, I think most of the countries of ASEAN, we were colonized before. And in the 60s, we have just achieved our independence. So we were exposed to the Cold War. And you know that when I talk about Cold War, there were two superpowers who wanted to exert their influence in Southeast Asia. So again, the leaders of this South Southeast Asia countries get together and they wanted to again make sure that we are not influenced to divide the lines of the Cold War. Second point. The third point is after the Cold War, although ASEAN was established in 67, we were still worried that what will happen after the Cold War. Cold War ended in 1991. So then you see that we were created in 1967. And what did we do? In 1971, we announced what we call it Declaration of Zofan, Zone of Peace, Freedom, and Neutrality. We do not want to be aligned with any of the superpower who was there at our region. But then what we did, in 1976, we have this Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. That was the first treaty done by ASEAN, again, what is TAC talking about? It's talking about code of conduct. We wanted to be neutral. We wanted to say that we should not be involved in any of the conflicts that we have. And if we were to involve in some conflicts, that is very clear. There were six points that spell out in TAC. And I have to announce to all of you, Argentina just acceded to TAC, just in 1st of August, okay? So this is what TAC. Then, as we from five become 10, we have countries that join us who also were in the conflict before, but they were members of ASEAN. Then we had ARF, ASEAN Regional Forum, in 1984. Okay, so again, ARF talks about, we wanted to have a forum where countries must have very clear in terms of their position. We do not want to be involved in any of the problems that were going on. So these three points made what ASEAN uh, came into birth in 1967. Thank you. So did I go beyond? Very well. Okay. You were, you, were, you were very close to the red card. Oh. <laughs> Ambassador of Indonesia. Ambassador of Nigeria. Uh, very good to have you again here at the Cali. Uh, we would like to ask you what will be the standing, if there is a common standing of ASEAN uh, in the upcoming uh, meeting of the G20. If not, what is the standing of Indonesia in the upcoming meeting of the G20? Uh, we would like to have your view. 
values of that. And also, what do you expect from the children? Thank you, Senator uh, Mario. First of all, Peggy, I would like to just remind you again that G20 is a forum. So as a forum, there, there is no binding, no negotiation. So this is a forum of a developed country who can exchange views, especially, especially uh, uh, in the economic sector. By saying that, as a consequence, that there is no internal ASEAN mechanism to discuss what will be the ASEAN standing on G20. Right? Because we are not negotiating anything. But as Indonesia is the only country who joined the G20, Indonesia represents uh, emerging economies. So we always voice what is the concern of emerging economies. For instance, uh, I also acknowledge that uh, every president of the G20 has the privilege to invite guests of uh, uh, G20. And ASEAN chairman this year is uh, held by Singapore. So Singapore uh, were invited to, was invited to many uh, uh, G20 meetings in uh, Buenos Aires and other cities in Argentina. But to my knowledge, Singapore came not to represent the voice of ASEAN, but it can also voice what this ASEAN has been doing related to issue discussed at the G20. Because in G20, as, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's always voiced their own position, not the, the region position. By saying that, uh, you also asking what is the hold of uh, ASEAN in the outcome of a G20 summit. Of course, as an emerging country, most of ASEAN countries are emerging uh, economies. We would like to see that the outcome of G20 support the multilateralism, because it's very important for us as an emerging economy. Because you also know that multilateralism is currently being challenged by you know, uh, various developments such as trade war and protectionism. We also would like to see that G20 member states will always uh, stick to the rule-based trade system under the WTO because it is uh, predictable, open, and inclusive. We would like also, as an emerging economy, that the, uh, the, the target to SDG target, we will have a common position. For instance, we would like to have like a combined financing in financing the target, to, to achieve the target of SDG. Not only the government has to finance the uh, activity to achieve the target, but we can also involve the private sectors. Other thing that also important for us, also in Asia, is the digital economy right now. Because it's very important for us, the digital economy, even though it's bring uh, uh, difficulties in many countries, because it's changing our the, the world of future world, but it also brings a good thing to many countries. Digital economy is important. It changes the landscape of our future world. We believe that digital economy will play an important role in driving the economy to achieve the inclusive of the norm. That's the rela relation of ASEAN and G20. But I cannot. I can assure you there is no strict position that this is an ASEAN position in G20 because G20 is only a form. I think I can you know answer your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor.
Now uh, I will ask the ambassador of Vietnam. Until a, just a few years ago, we used to talk about the Asia Pacific region. More recently, we started talking about the Indo Pacific region. I've just come back from Japan a few weeks ago, and it, Japan has launched this Indo Pacific initiative, uh, which they say is not a response to OBOR, to the Chinese proposal of the new Silk Road, but uh, some people understand that it can be a kind of reaction to this Chinese initiative. Uh, this Indo-Pacific initiative comprises not only East Asia, but also Southeast Asia, uh, India, Australia, and the eastern part of, uh, of Africa. So, Regarding this, what is, your, uh, what is your take on this political vision of this Indo-Pacific proposal? Okay, thank you for your question. I think I have uh, four points to make uh, for this question. Number one is that uh, actually, even before this initiative, there are already existing uh, mechanisms concerning political, security, economic, uh, in the region, uh, uh, that ASEAN plays a very important role, or the central role. Uh, I can name some as ASEAN plus three, plus ASEAN plus one, or uh, ARF, as he said, or EAS, that, which is very important. Uh, so that's number. That's, that's my point number one. Number two is that um, uh, at present. The, the, the idea of Indo-Pacific initiative or strategy is not the only initiative. There are other initiatives that you just mentioned, the New Silk Road, or you can say the One Bell One Road initiative, or even the Japanese suggestion of, I think, the expanded partnership for quality infrastructure. You know, so not only that Indo-Pacific initiative is being put out for the region to look at, but there are other initiatives. Against the background of the existing mechanism that we do have. And so I come to point number three, is that uh, we do notice all these initiatives, and we are now conducting very serious uh, discussion on these initiatives. And one of the key points when we discuss this is how we can keep the ASEAN centrality in this mechanism or structures or whatever you call it. Uh, that's very important for ASEAN because history, the current situation and the future can still consolidate our centrality. And we have been assuming that task for a long time, successfully. And uh, I come to the last point. In that spirit, uh, we, we look forward to further discussion with any initiators to talk about that, uh, including the Indo-Pacific concept. And I think uh, whatever the concept is, it should uh, maintain the principles of uh, ASEAN as centrality, uh, openness, transparency, inclusivity, and rule-based approach. And uh, I think that if that principles, all those principles can be maintained, uh, it can contribute to peace and stability and mutual benefit to the whole region. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Lakanlani, uh, Ambassador of the Philippines, recently arrived to our country. Uh, how the different initiatives of economic cooperation within ASEAN, such as GMS and uh, BIMP, EAGA, coexist with AEC integration process? Thank you, Ambassador Shuf. First of all, I'd like to uh, mention that the ASEAN economic community's vision is to have a highly integrated economic <coughs> community. 
and uh, which is <clears throat> outward looking and yet globally competitive. So even before the launching of the ASEAN Economic Community in 2015, the BIMIAGA and the GMS, these are the sub-regional um, frameworks, uh, have already existed. So BIM IAGA is composed of Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. IAGA means East Asia Growth Area. Now, if you will look at your map, fortunately, I cannot have a PowerPoint. These areas are belong to countries, or er areas in the BIM IAGA are contiguous to one another. And therefore, they share common concerns, special situations that they need to work together they can hasten also their economic development and social, social development. Now the same is true with the GMS. GMS is composed of uh, the greater Mekong uh, sub-regions. And the same idea, this was launched in 1992, which is earlier than the AEC. So these sub-regional uh, sub frameworks had all com had the same vision or the same goals, which is to integrate more closely by cooperating with one another. Now, these sub-regional groupings actually enhance or contribute to the ultimate goal of the ASEAN community to be highly integrated. So they are moving, they are contributing to the ultimate goal of ASEAN to be um, closely integrated. So there is actually clearly uh, a complementarity um, among the sub-regional groupings and the association, the ASEAN economic community. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Now I ask the Chairman of of Thailand what is your evaluation of EALAC as a tool to increase the engagement, deeper knowledge and cooperation among South Asia, Southeast Asia and Latin America? Thank you very much, Ambassador. I have to, I have to say hello to everyone first because I just arrived last week, you know, as Chair of Affairs of Thailand. So, uh, regarding the questions, so we have to inform you that the forum of the East Asia and Latin America of FELAX is an inter-regional multilateral forum that works as a key mechanism to promote the connectivity between ASEAN and also the Latin America. Since the establishment in 1999, the forum has created dialogue itself for the multilateral and also the intergovernmental organization level. Under the field, a number of projects and initiatives has been promoted and the uh, common value among people. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay, under the field, the number of projects has been initiated and promoted common value among the people of South Asia and Latin America. And also we have such many meetings between leaders and high-level officials to discuss at the policy level to increase uh, the connectivity between the two regions. Currently, the FIAC has expanded the function to four different working groups, okay, such as the Working Group on Socio-Political Cooperation and Sustainable Development, the Working Group on Culture, Youth, and Gender and Sports, the Working Group on the Trade Investment, Tourism, and also the Working Group on Science, Technology, and Innovation and Education. Today, Thailand, we, uh, Thailand is honored to be the part of the steering committee, as a, and also we uh, were member of the Free Act Troika, and which gave us a role uh, to the active promote in the value of Free Act, and also the contributing the country by having provided uh, for uh, one th uh, one hundred thousand US dollar to the Free Act Fund as well. Thus, it is without doubt that the Free Act also has been one of the crucial tools that has increased the engagement between Latin America and Southeast Asia. And thank you for the efforts and hard work of all member countries of Felix that we can able to have an effective impact to serve its goal. The goal is the linkage between the two regions. Thank you. Um, 
ambassador of Malaysia. Uh, now that uh, we are looking here uh, to the future, in perspective, what are the main achievements that you uh, think that ASEAN has obtained during this uh, 50 years of uh, uh, creation? Okay, thank you uh, for my second question. All right, we talk about achievement, we talk about the success story. So for me, ASEAN been there this year is 51 years. And I think ASEAN is the only regional corporation or entity which have brought, which have brought peace and stability to whole of Southeast Asia. So I think that is the biggest achievement that anybody can ask. You know, we were created at the background of the Cold War, and we went through it. We were a, politic, a loose political organization. Then we know to, in order to survive, we must be an economic might. We talk about economic integration, okay? We had our first FTA in 1992, and from there we moved forward. My colleague talked about AAC, economic community, and so on. But stability and peace and stability was the outcome of ASEAN. You know, we have 10 diverse countries who have different types of languages in the political system, uh, in the culture, and so on. But we managed to bring peace in ASEAN, and in the larger aspect, we brought peace to Southeast Asia. So I want to start with that. I think the achievement is on that point. And with due respect, I know probably somebody can ask, we have members who, from time to time, they have some issues. But with the ASEAN way, we managed to contain this. I can probably, or probably you can ask me, for the past 51 years, there were physically no wars in Southeast Asia and 100% the credit must go to ASEAN. ASEAN was there to discuss, to talk in the back doors. We have our ASEAN way. What is ASEAN way? Consensus and non-intervention. Intervention. We don't intervene in the members' country problem, but we bring the issue and discuss. And you know, some people can say, we talk from morning until dawn, but my answer will be, we come with a solution, and the solution works for ASEAN, okay? So peace and stability. Secondly, what did ASEAN bring? The achievement is we have networking. We have lengthy meetings. You know, ASEAN has 1,000 meetings per year. So, so somebody claims it is wasting of time, resources, and so on. But what is the outcome of the networking? With the networking meetings, we have countries like, with due respect, Myanmar, who was isolated before. They came out and joined ASEAN, and they joined our meeting end of the day. See where Myanmar is today. We managed to bring out Myanmar from isolation. That is the achievement of ASEAN. Second. Thirdly, the economic integration. I think you, can, you know where ASEAN is today. We are a GDP of 2.6 trillion US dollars. We are a population of 640 million, you know? And uh, we are now number seven in the world but by another 10 or 15 years, will be the fourth largest economy in the world. So the economic integration came from the peace and stability of ASEAN. Okay, so we are moving forward. Now we have institution building. We have done a lot from ASEAN. So I just want to say that the biggest achievement is to bring the peace and stability in Southeast Asia. Thank you. Ambassador, now is the turn of Ambassador of Indonesia. Hey, Ambassador, are there any measures regarding security cooperation that ASEAN will carry out to deal with maritime piracy? If so, which are those measures? Thank you. This is a very uh, important question. But I would like to relay again to what Ambassador Kalik has been said, what ASEAN way it is. So to, to answer your question, we have to always remember ASEAN way. If you're uh, asking about measure, 
So ASEAN measure is always first consensus, talking, communication. It's not bring our uh, armed forces to uh, uh, tackle any issues, be it uh, maritime piracy in the sea. So by saying this, uh, we in ASEAN region, of course, very concerned with the increasing trend of maritime transnational crimes, including the maritime piracy, uh, also armed robbery, kidnapping, illegal, unreported, and regulated, or we call it IUU fishing. This is all the transnational crime. There are uh, urgent need for ASEAN to address these challenges. But as uh, uh, Ambassador Khalid has been mentioned, we are uh, uh, association that has our own ways to deal with issues. At least there are three ASEAN framework to deal with this issue. First is ASEAN Ministerial Meeting on Transnational Crime, or we call it AMMTC, and also the Senior Official Meeting on the same issues. Also, we have the framework for defense, ASEAN Defense Minister Meeting. We call it ADMM. We also have ARF, ASEAN Regional Forum. So all the abbreviation is very uh, uh, difficult to remember in ASEAN. I believe you all know about this. But if you ask measure other than diplomacy and capacity building, ASEAN has developed specific measure which carried out by countries concerned. For instance, in the Sea of Sulu, we always have piracy, uh, kidnapping. So the trilateral cooperation between Indonesia, Malaysia, and Philippines. We have a special uh, uh, forum to communicate, to exchange information, to eliminate the threat of armed robbery at sea, to eliminate kidnapping and sea piracy. This trilateral cooperation underlines commitment to increase, for instance, like petrol on the sea, uh, establish national focal points, because uh, it's very important if Indonesia was kidnapped in a Sulu Sea, who that we have to talk to, to, to contact in maybe in Philippines or in Malaysia. And we have to set up a hotline communication. We also agreed to implement a set of standard operating procedure, how to deal, how to communicate with the kidnappers, for instance. So if you talk about measure, ASEAN way measure is not armed forces. Thank you. Ambassador Su, Ambassador of Vietnam. Uh, watching recently, the last two years, lots of changes in the international economic environment. We would like to uh, hear your comments on how do you think these uh, changes in the international economic environment, uh, like uh, uh, higher tariffs, uh, exchange rates uh, higher and uh, so forth have affected uh, ASEAN or uh, have affected countries of uh, uh, members of ASEAN? Okay, thank you. This is a very big question actually and I have only three minutes to answer. Uh, but, I, uh, but I think it's, it's a common sense that um, the international trade or international economy changes affect all countries in the world, no exception. So I really think that uh, it affects us all. However, for ASEAN, most of our economies are very open. We are export-oriented economies. So the changes in international economy situations really affect us in various ways, aspects, and levels, depending on individual countries. Uh, I think uh, very recently, last October, at the gatherings in Bali, in Indonesia, our leaders 
I acknowledge that, that the complications of uh, international economic situation right now is partly due to the uh, changes in the strategies of major powers, or you may call it the trade frictions, or we call it trade war, or anything. Uh, all these are the, the trend of protectionism, which really affect us all. So uh, my colleague here also mentioned about the fourth revolutionary, a revolution in technology. These things uh, affect us all. So what do we do to deal with this? We do it in two ways. Number one, we try to s consolidate the mechanism within ourselves to keep the trip flow within ourselves with, through our mechanism in economy like the AEC and various um, mechanisms that you, know, you will forget right away when I mention them because they are very complicated. However, we do it two ways. One, we do it internally and two, we do it with other partners. So ASEAN, for example, most notably, now we are dealing with six other countries to do the regional comprehensive economic uh, program. Um, we call it RCEP. And we have gone through 23 rounds of talk with this. And we are still uh, in discussion with this group, but we are hopeful that reaching out to other region, uh, other groupings would help us alleviate the negative effect of the international uh, situation and maximize the opportunity, opportunities that it may offer. So uh, we do hope that um, uh, our optimism or the optimism that is shared by IMF or World Bank uh, can be achieved because IMF and World Bank still estimates that our growth rate, our means ASEAN economy growth rate, will continue to develop or to be maintained at 5.2% this year, or 5.3% next year. So that's very optimistic. And I have the reasons to believe that we can achieve that right. Thank you. Well, Ambassador of the Philippines. Uh, how do AEC integration process coexist with different trade make agreements such as CPTTP and RCEP? Thank you. Um, as your question states, AEC integration process. I will start with uh, the, the uh, RCEP, which has been mentioned by the ambassador of, of Vietnam. RCEP, uh, the ASEAN RCEP, or the um, it's really a mouthful, actually. Regional Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Partnership. Uh, this is an initiative of ASEAN to harmonize and unify all the six free trade agreements which it has with each individual dialogue partner. So we have, as Ambassador Zung has mentioned, we have six FTAs. ASEAN plus one FTA, so how we refer it to. So we're trying to have a common free trade agreement. But of course, uh, as Ambassador Sung has mentioned, there have been a series of negotiations. It is not an easy agreement to, to conclude because each country and each of the dialogue partners have special concerns. And also because of the element of protectionism, it's not easy for everybody to accept common agreement. But we hope that Singapore, as chair, of, uh, as, as chair of the ASEAN this year, will be able to conclude the RCEP. Now, once the RCEP is concluded, it will be the largest trade deal in terms of population, because it will account for an aggregate of 3.5 billion people based on 2016 data. It will contribute about 32% of global GDP and over a quarter of world exports. 
So we hopefully, hopefully RCEP will provide a framework aimed at lowering trade barriers and securing, securing improved market access for goods and services for businesses in the region. Now, RCEP will also be open to third parties outside of the six uh, dialogue partners through accession in the future. Now, the other grouping which was mentioned was uh, the CPTPP, or the uh, Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. This agreement is composed of 11 countries. Four of the ASEAN countries are members of this uh, of this uh, framework, uh, namely, um, uh, we have um, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and Singapore. So four out of the ten. Now this is different because this is not in the context of ASEAN. It is more or less you can consider this like a bilateral agreement. One ASEAN country, sovereign, would like to see advantages in joining this framework and therefore they are free to do so. Being a member of ASEAN doesn't prohibit you or prevent you from entering into other agreements where it would be beneficial or mutually beneficial to the country. So um, there is no conflict between uh, the ASEAN economic the integration process, but it will probably also hasten um, or, or contribute to the, uh, um, the vigorous trade relations between the members of ASEAN and the members of the CPTPP. Mr. Yuwari uh, Sharseda Fer of the Embassy of Thailand. Uh, which are the main cultural links that you consider and highlight as the most important ones in the relationship between ASEAN and Latin America? Okay, even though the Southeast Asian and Latin America is quite far apart by this term, we also have shared some of the similar roots and common values. Firstly, both regions comprise with the developing countries and we are grouping together in the regional platform just as ASEAN and Mercosur. And secondly, we are also quite similar uh, in the cultural links. You know, we, we, we get used to use the chili or spicy in our cuisine as well. And also, because this is also important from the region of uh, Southeast Asia to the Latin America, and we also have a link by the Latin culture and during the, the colonial trade links in for many hundred years ago as well. But, but thirdly, this is my personal, I think that the people of those regions share one common value. It means that we share the thing that we call the openness to the world. We are easily adapted for the foreigner of many countries as well. And we are open uh, in the, uh, the culture. We are fun-loving, we are sports-loving, also the family-oriented. Because we are maybe, we are based on a cultural basis community. We also both have an openness in mind and sharing, and also we have a, we are sharing Ka'am Horner traditional indigenous knowledge, which are also resulted in the you know, Asian civilization and also the long history that we have in two regions. Thank you very much. Well, Tato Halim, Ambassador of Malaysia. Which have been the main obstacles that challenge the cohesion of the organization of ASEAN along the last 50 years? Thank you. Uh, uh, I also have to call him Dato Sadus. He was given a very high honor by government of Malaysia because he was the ambassador of Malaysia for six years. I think we can clap for, okay, we can give a round of applause for that. Yeah. Okay, so question about main obstacle and challenges uh, on the cohesion of ASEAN. I think I want to start this by quoting what we have an EPG, Eminent Person Group. 
which was created way back in uh, 10 years ago during our ASEAN Charter in 2007. And this great uh, EPG group mentioned, very simple, in a simple word, ensuring compliance and effective implementation of decision. That is the obstacle. So I repeat again, ensuring compliance and effective implementation of decision. So in uh, describing this statement, I, I will uh, put it in four points. One, although we are 10 countries, we talk about unity in diversity, but we have uh, a common problem on the different political system, we have different economic system, we have different foreign policies, and also we have a different security outlook. Each country has their own problems or their own stand in these uh, points that I mentioned to you. By the end of the day, when in ASEAN, we talk about consensus. We talk about the overall big picture of ASEAN. So although diversity is a strength, but it can be a weakness. We are, we are yet to be tested in full, in, this, in, in totality, in this first point. Second point, very clearly there is a big development gap. We have 10 countries, and you know we were five countries first before, in 1967, 84, Brunei joined, 95, Vietnam joined us, 97, we have Laos and uh, Myanmar, and 99, we have Cambodia. So we have 10 countries, and you know very well, in ASEAN, we believe that every country must prosper together. There should not be a big gap between 10 countries. Although on papers, everything looks fine, we do respect, but we know that this development gap can become a big problem in the future. Uh, I would say for 51 years, we managed to contain this problem. We managed to talk in a clear terms. We talk about a big picture, but we do not know where we will be another 50 years on this point. On third point, institution, institutional constraint. ASEAN, as you said, we have 10 countries. We have a secretariat in Jakarta. We have a lot of dec decision, but we are not sure uh, if all this decision can be implemented. There was a survey to say we only implement 50% of what we have agreed. We know this is a big task. We are doing our homework. We are talking to each other. We try to be uh, in, in one voice in all the problems, but this institutional constraint is just not because of, we are not doing our work, because there is a lot of things which is going around. Yeah, some of these decisions need follow up and so on. So this can become obstacles or and already showing some sign of problems which we are trying to uh, overcome. But the biggest problem or obstacle we see is the resilience on geopolitical. You know what is going on. Southeast Asia, uh, I think is now the, I will not say hot spot, but if you talk about trade war, the trade war is affecting ASEAN countries. We are, as my, mention, my colleague mentioned, we are the major countries who are exporting and importing, and we are strategically located in the root of trade. Yeah? You know, Street of Malacca, South China Sea, and so on, are the important trading routes. So this geopolitical issue can become a problem to us if we do not contain. That's why we are very clear. We want to stay, stay neutral. We welcome all major powers to come and trade with us, but we want to have our own position, which is the ASEAN way. Thank you very much. Ambassador of Indonesia. Uh, well, uh, Ambassador of Malaysia, just mentioned how during the 90s you expanded uh, uh, ASEAN and you completed a number of 10 uh, countries of Southeast Asia. The question now is, are you uh, going to have uh, new members? 
what is the situation of uh, East Timor, uh, what's uh, the possibilities of uh, East Timor to join the, uh, the ASEAN group? Well, actually, uh, this question has been lingering for some time because uh, Timor-Leste is, as you well know, that it is exactly located in Southeast Asia. So ASEAN is open to enlargement, but it has a criteria to be uh, acknowledged as a member. First is the country location, of course, because it's Southeast Asia Association, right? And also it should be recognized by ASEAN member state. The third one, the country who is going to be a member should sign an agreement to be bound and abide by the charter. We have a very uh, binding charter in 2007. When we implemented this charter, it came into 2015. And then the fourth one, the country should have uh, ability and willingness to carry out the obligation of the members. We knew that uh, Timor-Leste is in Southeast Asia, of course, and we acknowledge. And it has already mentioned its willingness to sign the charter. But we have to see whether this country has the ability to abide all the rules and has willingness to carry out the obligation as a member state. As now, the ASEAN country, the 10 ASEAN country, uh, has a task force to oversee and to check the readiness of uh, Timor-Leste to become a member. The process is still going on, has yet to be discussed, and I believe in November, this November, the, when the foreign ministry of uh, ASEAN country will be meet, meet in Singapore, they will discuss this issue again. So the issue of Timor-Leste becoming a member of uh, ASEAN is still open, not yet decided. Ambassador of Vietnam. Which have been the mechanisms and ways applied by ASEAN to expand trade and investment within the organization? Okay, thank you for the question because this question is really a follow-up for this, the previous question that you asked me. So I really think that um, uh, for this uh, question, I would like to concentrate or focus more on what we do together internally to help uh, ASEAN to get out of, get the best of the situation, to make the best of the situation. So, uh, as my colleague said, AEC, the ASEAN Economic Community, make it one of the first priority uh, to promote our trade and investment within the group. And I'd like to give some uh, numbers because I, I can't memorize all of them. In 2017, out of 2.20 billion US dollars in ASEAN commodity trade value, the intra-ASEAN trade accounted for 22 or 23 percent. That's a lot. We do a lot together so that we can help each other and complement each other. So this number uh, can highlight, and in uh, FDIs, our internal FDIs is 137 billion US dollars, accounting for uh, around 20% of the FDI coming to the region. So, this to show how important it is for us to be trading within our group and how to invest within our group. So that's why uh, in, we note, we acknowledge this important, the important role. So we have taken steps to do two things. 
Number one, in legal framework. We set up legal frameworks so that the internal trade can be flowed smoothly and easily within us. And there are many frameworks. And I would like to mention one, ASEAN Trade in Goods Agreement. We call it ATIGA. And we have another one is for ASEAN Comprehensive Investment uh, Agreement. We call it ASEAN. So, plus with many other smaller protocols or decrees or decisions taken by ourselves, this legal framework do, uh, does help us to make the trade flow more smoothly. And on the second aspect, uh, as my uh, colleague, uh, the ambassador from Malaysia says, we try to implement all those decisions made by our leaders at various meetings so that we can truly facilitate trade and investment within our group. So uh, I, I can give you one uh, figure. We have eliminated about 99% of all tariffs within the region. And we will apply zero tariff in goods in 2019. That means next year. We will have no tariff at all among ourselves. And regarding service trade, we are finalizing the agreement so that it can help to replace the, uh, our agreement on service trading. We are finalizing this, upgrading it so that it can be better responding to the current situation and the future. And we are also upgrading the investment agreement so that we can make it easier for ASEAN members to invest in each other's country. And uh, <clears throat> the last part uh, is that we are going to publish a study which will help us to identify key trade facilitation initiatives and measures that would contribute to meeting the target of 10% reduction in trade transaction cost because the cost is really important to all businessmen. So we are trying to reduce that 10% by 2020, and we try to double our intra-ASEAN trade by 2025. That's our aim. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador of uh, Philippines. Uh, can we learn something about the uh, design of uh, programs for energy development in, uh, in the ASEAN group? And uh, specifically, also, we are interested in, uh, in learning something about if you have any plans for nuclear energy. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Shu. Well, as everybody will realize, energy is key to realizing the ASEAN economic community um, and power will be very important for us to move forward and uh, to sustain this and uh, the ASEAN uh, had to cre create um, an ASEAN plan of action for 2016 to 2025 uh, which um, outlines uh, key initiatives uh, towards energy development in the, in the region and this covers uh, embarking on multilateral um, electricity trading to accelerate uh, the realization of, ASEAN, of an ASEAN power grid, um, and enhancing gas connectivity to expanding the focus of the trans-ASEAN gas pipeline uh, to include the liquefied natural gas and also to um, uh, for, for terminals to be established uh, as well as to promote clean coal technology. Um, of course, uh, we will also be looking into a mix of renewable energies and plus energy efficiency measures. 
Um, with respect to the ASEAN, um, the direction towards the use of uh, nuclear energy for peaceful uses or, or civilian purposes or uh, source of power, um, there is a recognition already uh, of uh, the importance of nuclear energy and uh, as, as an option uh, for power, power source. And therefore, um, there was a created a nuclear energy cooperation subsector network. In, it was created in 2008. And this would be a specialist body in ASEAN to uh, shepherd ASEAN cooperation in, in this area, sharing um, information, um, exchanging technical assistance, networking, and training. However, up to this point, or up to 2017, as of 2017, there has been no political decision, definite political decision, to go into nuclear power. Um, for many reasons, um, I can speak of the Philippines, and, and uh, before I go into that, but there has already been a study on the different stages of, of nuclear preparedness of the ASEAN countries. Um, some countries in the ASEAN already have the infrastructure because they use uh, nuclear energy for medical purposes, for, agro, for, for agriculture, for food, um, also for peaceful uses in general. And some already have research um, reactors. So, and, and they have also trained human resources to, to handle um, the application of, of, of nuclear energy. So there are different stages of, of nuclear preparedness, but nothing yet specific to go and establish towards establishing a nuclear power plant for, electric, for electricity. Um, I don't know the other countries may be able to, to say something about that, but if uh, the study which was conducted by the ASEAN Center uh, for Energy, uh, this, they made or they published a pre-feasibility study on the establishment of nuclear power plants in ASEAN. And they identified uh, countries which are the front runners, for front runners to establish nuclear power plants in the region. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know, you may correct me, but this is part of the study. Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, and the Philippines have already to some degree certain infrastructure, but not yet as fully developed as required to have a nuclear power plant. Um, it is also said, the study said that Indonesia is expected to commercialize its first experimental nuclear power plant by 2030. And Malaysia and Thailand are expected to introduce nuclear power to the respective national energy mix by 2035, while Vietnam and the Philippines are committed to introducing nuclear energy um, in the long term. As I said, no, uh, no definite political decision has been taken. Why? Because there's still the issue of public acceptance of nuclear power, nuclear energy. And uh, the safety issue is a huge concern. And of course, with recent, uh, um, recent events of terrorism, uh, the, uh, the issue of, of security and safety in terms of, of um, keeping these nuclear power plants secure from terrorist activities has become uh, a growing concern. So therefore, this will probably be factors that might inhibit or delay any decision, concrete decision, towards building a nuclear power plant. Thank you. Well, now to the Shangri-La Affair of Thailand. What are the initiatives taken by ASEAN to expose its cultural diversity to the rest of the world? Okay, okay. A number of cultural activities and initiatives has been carried out by ASEAN with the will to promote the cultural diversity both among ASEAN and also outside ASEAN. We have the ASEAN Cultural Center. It was established in Thailand to serve as the initiative for learning center for cultural heritage of ASEAN member states. And also the platform for the sister 
uh, from external countries to learn the cultural diversity in ASEAN. Okay. In 2019, Thailand will assume the ASEAN uh, chairmanship next year. And also, ASEAN has proved that the, it to the world for the strong people to people connection and the important tools that to strengthen the closer bond between ASEAN people and other community. Thailand proposed uh, the year 2019 to be designated as the ASEAN Cultural Year, which also agreed by the meeting during the ASEAN Ministry and Ministers, the possible for the culture and arts in October this year. And the ASEAN Cultural Year is next year aims to make ASEAN the, fi the finest culture we know to be in the form of the ASEAN Cultural Roadshow. We have many roadshow under the theme. We have three, key, three keywords about this one. This need first is diversify, uh, creativity, and sustainability. And in the ASEAN cultural troops, we expect it to perform in many countries, okay, including uh, our ASEAN country, and also in, in the foreign countries like Japan, China, and South Korea, which they are also already to register and their interest to have a co-host with ASEAN for the showcasing for the, our uh, cultural troupe next year. ASEAN stands ready to welcome you to visit and with all the events that we, uh, we will carry out and also we look forward to have a closely tied with, uh, of the cultural linkage between ASEAN and also in Latin America. Thank you very much. Well, now we are going to have the last round of uh, questions. Uh, Ambassador of Malaysia, this, is a, this question is a question that we always uh, have discussions uh, with you and your colleagues. Uh, which are uh, the main threats that uh, you consider the organization of ASEAN will face in the future? Thank you. Uh my good friend. Uh, certainly, my, this question is related to what I've answered in my third question just now, the main threats that any organization will face. And as you know, we are already passing the 50 years of the establishment of ASEAN. So the main threat will be, again, the diversity. We are 10 countries with differences. And I say that although we have managed to contain these differences, until now, but we are not sure in the future because things are changing every day. The landscape, the environment, and also the uh, powers who are in South Asia, this first. Secondly, uh, I think we, as you, as you know, that after we have uh, organized ourselves in the political area, we become a big economic might in the economy. So we have the economic integration. But still, we must know that 10 ASEAN countries, we have a big portion of our SMEs, small and medium enterprises. So it has been said that ASEAN need to do a lot to rectify, to complement the SMEs. So this is another area that we think can, can become a threat to the ASEAN economic integration. We are working on that and we hope we can achieve a standard or we can uh, overcome these problems that we are having in the SMEs. Number three, uh, this I like to compare with the European Union. Certainly we are not European Union, we are not a custom union. But ASEAN, uh, that, that been, that, there, there is a survey done and we sense that in ASEAN citizen, we don't have the sense of ASEAN. We don't call ourselves as, as ASEAN citizen. We always uh, uh, say that we are from Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, and so on. So we must have the sense of ASEAN in ASEAN. So I think the countries need to do more. We need to educate our people. We must think like ASEAN. Number three. Number four. It's uh, again, uh, I think uh, I can, uh, I don't want to mention about the geopolitical 
the, the, the superpowers and so on, but still, this political, uh, this superpower influence in the Southeast Asia can also become a threat if the countries choose to take side. So ASEAN must not take side. We must uh, talk and speak on a single language and voice, which is the ASEAN centrality. So again, people say, don't only talk central, act central. So we need to act central in bringing ASEAN to, uh, to a better position. And the last problem that we think or threat that we believe that we can have is on the, again, we don't want to compare with the European Union, but we don't have an ASEAN foreign policy. We have policies of the 10 countries that are together and decide, and we saw the bigger pictures that we must be united, we must have consensus, we must at one point to give in in some of even our national interests to have this bigger picture of ASEAN. So I believe until now we have achieved it and we are trying our best to make sure ASEAN will be there for another 50 years. Thank you very much. Well, the last question for the Ambassador of Indonesia. Which are the areas we should work on in order to achieve a good contribution within the frame of the TAC? For Argentina? Okay, thank you. Actually, before I answer that question, I would like to congratulate the government of Argentina for signing the accession of agreement of the EC in uh, Singapore, uh, uh, February. What is it? June? In August. In August, yeah. Uh, to answer this question, we have to go back to the TEC itself. What is TEC? TEC is a code of conduct, as just mentioned before. Code of conduct that aims to manage the interstate relation within and outside the region. So this one has to be a bear in our mind first. To be able to communicate, to interact, to cooperate with other countries we are abide by this code of conduct. If you look at the TEC itself, chapter three is regarding cooperation. There are many cooperation that mentioned in this chapter. For instance, cooperation in uh, economic sectors, cooperation in social sector, cooperation in uh, political sector. So if you look at the article four of chapter three, any parties of the TEC has to promote active cooperation in economic, social, technical, scientific, and administrative field, and so on and so on. So Argentina, being a, a party of this TEC, meaning that it has to promote all those code of conduct when it is uh, interaction with other countries. I would like to say, for instance, Argentina is very uh, advanced in agriculture. So how to promote cooperation with region in the Southeast Asia is by maybe uh, sharing uh, research or joint research or technical assistance to uh, the region in order to also promote the agriculture sector in the region. This is one thing. So there are many things that Argentina can play because uh, if you all aware of that, TAC is the first instrument that is bind binding all the membership <coughs> before we have the char charter in 2015. So this is a very uh, uh, high commitment for any countries to abide by the code of conduct. So I can uh, mention many things that Argentina can do, but I can only say the important thing is the code of conduct and the uh, advances of the agriculture in Argentina that can be promoted to ASEAN countries. Thank you. Uh, 
What is your opinion on the impact of One Belt, One Road China project for the region? Okay, this is another tough question. And, um, but I really think that, as I said at the very beginning, in my first uh, answer to the first question about the different mechanisms that are initiatives that are introduced into the region, uh, we, I mentioned to, uh, three initiatives that, w that were outstanding. Number one is uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific, okay? The second one is BRI, the One Bell, One Road initiative. And the third one is the expanded partnership for uh, quality uh, infrastructure by Japan, okay? So this question is mainly about BRI, the Bell, One Belt, One Road. So first, uh, my first point is that these initiatives reflect to some extent the strategic competition among major powers in this region. And I think these, initi these initiatives more or less, at certain degree, challenge ASEAN centrality because they came from their own interests. The initiator, I mean, they didn't put ASEAN first. So it challenges, or they challenge ASEAN centrality in one way or another. So, well, however, as I said at the very beginning, we are willing to explore all these initi initiatives because it is a matter of fact. Our role is to make the most out of it and minimize the, the worst if it happens to us. So that's, that's number, number one point. Number two is that uh, for BRI, actually almost all of us, ASEAN, have participated in one initiative or another project put forth within the BRI initiatives. So, however, we do keep in mind uh, the possibility of how to pay back, we call it the affordability, of getting into the project because most of infrastructure constructions are very expensive. And it is not you receiving the funding, but you have to pay as well. So people are keeping in the back of their mind whether this is another bad, bad trap, or if they don't solve it by themselves, it would be the bad trap. And so that's one thing we have to keep in mind. Uh, right now, uh, I can give you this piece of information. Indonesia and the Secretariat of ASEAN are working on a paper studying these initiatives. Uh, I mean, both uh, the freedom and open, uh, free and open in the Pacific, the BRI and the uh, quality infrastructure put by Japan, and we think we don't know when the paper will be finalized, but we do think that these initiatives should help maintain ASEAN centrality and fully reflect our concern and interest of all parties mentioned in the initiative and respect international law and contributing to equal cooperation and mutual benefit in the region. Well, one last question, open to any of, of your ambassadors who, who will take it, you decide. How have you fostered an ASEAN identity among the population of the different member countries? <laughs> yes, my turn. <laughs> fostering an ASEAN identity among the people is always one of the most important uh, priority for the ASEAN people. We put it in the ASEAN Charter, Article number 35, that 
ASEAN shall promote in its common ASEAN identity and the sense of belonging and amongst its people in order to achieve its shared destiny, goals, and values. And also the second thing is, we put it also in the ASEAN Sociocultural uh, Community Blueprint 2035, which indicates that ASEAN aims to create the community that is aware and proud of the identity, culture, and heritage with the strengthened ability to innovate and proactively contribute to the global community. And also another thing in order to achieve that, the, the, we have one keyword that unity in diversity. It means that ASEAN recognize the necessity to foster the greater awareness of the in, in the diverse culture by respecting its divergence of culture, languages, and religions of the people among ASEAN. And also, we, ha we have the ASEAN Foundation. It is a non-profit organization that was established to support the ASEAN identity and people-to-people -people connectivity. Also, we have a very sky of activities, such as for the young people level. We have a model of ASEAN meeting with, with the simulation of the ASEAN meeting for, under, for the undergraduate students from across the ASEAN region. And also, we have the ASEAN Data Science Explorer. Uh, it's a competition that uh, to aim for the enhanced awareness and uh, appreciation for the ASEAN community amongst the undergraduate students through the digital literacy uh, intervention. Apart from the, the, founda uh, the ASEAN Foundation, we, they have, we, have also, ASEAN, we also have another activity such as the ASEAN-based performing arts. The concert, we have a, we organize a concert that uh, features the music, uh, musical gems from across the ASEAN. And, uh, and also we have the ASEAN Media Corporation to enhance the role of media to promote the ASEAN identity among people in many uh, uh, sources, just like newspaper, television, and also in the social media like Facebook, Twitter as well. ASEAN now we still seek for another alternative channel and activities to promote the sense of the pride and identity for amongst people, such as a sense of belonging in the richness, history, languages, culture, and also common values that will lead to the genuine people-centered people community. This is our goal for us. Thank you very much.